my husband likes to uh, <clears throat> bring home little things from the office uh, that he thinks will speak to me. And uh, this past week, he brought home a little cartoon, a, a, a picture of a, a Russian proverb, I guess, that apparently is uh, absent-mindedness is looking for the horse you're riding on. <laughs> and he just laid it on the counter. So I, I think he, uh, <laughs> he was trying to tell me something. Uh, I did find it. <laughs> um, and uh, I, it reminded me of a uh, flashback to scenes of childhood. I think um, probably every teacher I had, in, particularly in elementary school, thought I was an, a, a horribly absent-minded child. Um, I spent a lot of time looking, apparently not at the front of the classroom <laughs> where the teacher was. And um, I always had to um, ask somebody else directions on what she just said when it was clear that we were supposed to be doing something different than what I was doing. And um, this was, uh, this was, I know, depending upon my teacher, very distressing to some of them. Uh, and and I, I oftentimes look back on that, and now as an adult, I realize that it must have been very frustrating for them to be putting all the work into teaching and for it to seem like I was just off in another place. But I, I wish I'd let, been able to let them know, yes, I was off in another place, but I wasn't absent. I was present someplace else. And I was present in a powerful way. I, I spent a lot of time, I realized in school that there was a lot I didn't understand about people. I spent a lot of my time gazing at people in the classroom and what they were doing. And then I'd look out the window and try to imagine what it was that they were thinking and experiencing in doing that. Now, the teacher never saw that happen and maybe didn't realize there was a connection between my gazing out the window and the fact that I really was kind of like trying to help people out in class at different times in different ways throughout the day because I thought it was so neat that I understood something about their nature and their need by watching them in the classroom. So it got me thinking about these Beatitudes. I, I read through all of them again and I, and I came up with you know, a little kind of definition for each one of them. I'm gonna share that with you. But it got me thinking about how sometimes when we seem absent from one thing, it's not really because we're absent, it's because we're truly present to something else going on. Now in Matthew's gospel, you remember that Jesus is born as a king in a stable, wise people come to look for him, and that kingship is proclaimed by a star over that stable, but there's another king in a palace nearby searching for that rival king. And that tension between the kingdoms of this world that operate one way and the kingdoms of the baby in the stable that operate another way runs all throughout the story of Jesus and it's still running throughout our world today. And I wanna suggest that the Beatitudes are calling us to look at the kingdom values. They do not scream out to us the way the values of this worldly kingdoms scream out to us, but they are nevertheless real and their hope will be vindicated. So I wanna, want to think with you uh, just about a definition of each one of these things briefly. Blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, some translations say happy are the poor in spirit. I, uh, I understand uh, that happiness is a, a potential translation for that, but I think the, the emphasis of, of, the, of Jesus' teaching right here is about speaking God's blessedness, a promised blessedness, on circumstances in life that do not always look happy on their face. 
So uh, I'm, I'm a little bit cautious about saying happy are those who, because it makes it sound like another how-to guide on how to succeed at happiness. And it's really not that. It's the Beatitudes, blessed are those who are, they will. It's really about a promise of God's vindication of people who are living the values of the kingdom that was born in the stable. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. It means blessed are people who are humble and not arrogant. People who are aware of their own, of their own need, their, their lack of, of completion, their, perhaps their imperfections, but mostly that they're aware that our lives are not entirely in our control, and in fact, they are a gift to us. We are dependent on God, ultimately, for our security and for our identity. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn is talking about uh, not just any kind of grieving, although that is part of it, but blessed are those who are mourning because the world and things that we see in the world are not always what it's supposed to be. There's a particular kind of mourning that goes with being aware of the gap between what could be and what should be and what is. Sometimes that's an awareness of a personal loss, but sometimes it's more often it's just a, a simply an awareness of things that are not right and mourning because of it. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who are gentle, who have renounced violent methods of power or coercive methods of getting one's own way. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This, blessed are the people who long for vindication of right, who are looking for justice and on the basis of the faith that God will vindicate the just and do justice in this world, actively work towards it themselves. Blessed are the merciful not just people who, who feel merciful, but people who do concrete acts of mercy, people who demonstrate actions that offer others forgiveness or second chances, people who may not look uh, deserving of a, being a good investment in one's time and energy and caring, but who because of simply being a precious gift of God and a in a human life, are recipients of mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. Pure in heart means people who have single-minded devotion to God, people who really focus their hope and, and their um, examination of their lives, their choices and their values on trying to live God's way in the world. And blessed are the peacemakers. Not just people who don't like to ruffle feathers, but people who seek positive actions for bringing about reconciliation, bringing about groups coming together who don't understand each other, people who work for understanding. So uh, as I went down this uh, list and, and started imagining what they looked like, I at first got kind of despairing because I, I think I was looking to grab some examples of, of, of the kingdom that Jesus was speaking of out of the headlines. And um, I, I didn't feel like a lot of grab was going to come out of the headlines of examples of what those things look like. But then I remembered, it's actually when I remembered my absent-minded self and how if you want to see the values of another realm of attention, what they look like in this world, they are probably not going to scream out loudly. You're going to probably have to look for quieter things. And I started thinking about quiet people in this congregation. 
And in keeping with the, the spirit of Beatitudes of people probably not wanting to be named, I'm going to tell you about some people in this congregation who are living kingdom values. I'm not going to use their names. You may recognize yourself or somebody else, but I, I'm just going to tell you some of those, some of those stories uh, because it really, it really gave me hope. The first one uh, about uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, I think about the people who week after week, um, or maybe even for the first time, fill out a prayer card and ask other people to pray for something that's going on in their lives or something that's going on in someone else's life. We have someone who almost every week asks for a specific prayer request for homeless people and people who are in very marginalized situations that he works with in, uh, through his social service work. He prays for them. He takes the needs that he sees in his job and he brings them before this community for our prayer team to pray for them regularly. He is trusting that the things that he is also working on ultimately need and depend on a good and gracious God to be at work in this world also. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And for all of the people who regularly pray, get the email each week with the list of names and take time to pray for them. They are focusing their hope on the work of the spirit of God. Blessed are they who mourn. This was an interesting one I, I got. Um, this morning, I had a message through the Facebook uh, page. Uh, as a King Avenue Facebook administrator, we get messages to people who reach out to us. And I got a message from a woman who asked um, if in a few weeks from, from now, if on a Sunday at about 1230, we, if there would be someone from the church who would pray with people who are um, going on a march uh, to remember missing persons. And it's a march uh, that they've been doing every year for 15 years now, since a young man by the name of Brandon Schaefer went missing from Ohio State Medical School and has never been found. And they're starting at the med they started the medical school and they marched by here on their way to the last place he was seen. Uh, is it Ugly Tuna Saloon? Okay. And um, they wanted to know if someone, if they could stop by here and pray with us. And I thought, wow, mourning for 15 years, remembering and hoping that someone will be found or will not be forgotten, that what happens to them matters. I was, I was kind of humbled by by someone having that kind of determination. And then I found out that the woman who runs this Facebook page and organizes this march was not even related to that person. She was simply a person in Southeast Ohio who heard about him and cared about it and wanted to make a place where people who are missing could be remembered, where their families could know that other people cared. And they have been willing to be open to mourning with those who are mourning. And I thought, wow, what are the options if you're not, if you have a big loss and you're upset about something, you're sad about something and you don't mourn? If you don't mourn and you don't feel supported in your mourning, what do you do? You get angry. You bury that sadness and it comes out as anger. What do you do? You, you, you decide I've got to shut off this bad feeling. I'm going to, I'm just, nothing matters. I'm going to become cynical. And there are a lot of people who don't have support in mourning and don't feel solidarity in mourning. And so they become angry or cynical or, or just kind of check out of everything. And when we support each other in real mourning, we do so because we believe that those who mourn, God will com bring comfort to. Then I wanted to think about blessed are the 
are the meek, the gentle, those who have renounced violent methods of power. I thought about uh, the person whose, whose family had been affected by the Puerto Rico um, you know, devastation and how angry you could be about the inequities uh, of the treatment of the people who have been uh, fallen victim to that disaster there. You know, you could want to be really nasty and fight and protest and, and instead we have someone among us who has just organized a wonderful relief effort and got friends to help and you all helped. $4,500 went to that uh, offering that was taken up that day. Instead of getting angry, this person decided to do something that showed, that showed that they cared, but it was done in a, a gentle, a meek way. I thought about people who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We have someone here in the congregation who consistently, in every uh, context she is, is lifting up before people the need to create ways of being inclusive of people with all ranges of gifts and abilities, not just in school and outside in society, but here in our classes, here in our community, who's consistently reminding us of the importance of that and giving us information. And it helps us be attentive to the wide range of needs of all kinds of children and adults so that we can be more of the people of God who affirm the blessedness of every person. She is hungering and thirsting for righteousness and keeps on believing and hoping and trusting that she will be vindicated. Blessed are the pure in heart and blessed are the merciful. We have people in this congregation who uh, have dedicated themselves to regular trips abroad to help children in need other places. Places where children, um, where there's so much need that children could easily be forgotten. Handicapped children in Haiti, the children in the orphanage at Piedras Negras, who have um, ended up there through one circumstance or another of individual stories with great difficulty. Um, people in this congregation have made it their passion to remember those children and their needs and to be there offering mercy in the name of Christ, in the name of human love. When I think about the pure in heart, I think about the people in Bible study classes. I, 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 our disciple Bible study started up again. It's kind of, you know, a little bit of heavy lifting. You have to do a lot of reading. And I, I didn't think uh, after the break uh, a young man was going to come back who's uh, a young father. His wife is expecting in a little while. He's uh, an attorney. He's got a pretty full load. He drives from pretty far away but he wants to learn more about God. He comes because he wants to know how to be more devoted to God. So he studies and he does his homework most of the time as far as I can tell. And it, it really is an inspiring example to me about someone being pure and seeking God. And then I think about peacemakers. I know there's a small group that, that uh, decided that they wanted to try to understand more how different people in our world today understand politics and why people have different positions. Instead of just deciding, well, we think this and people who think differently are fill in the blanks, they, they want to try to learn together as a group how to be better at at conducting dialogue that reaches understanding and appreciation for different perspectives so that, so that we can build a better common way of interacting with each other as we face difficult challenges in our world. 
Now the stories that I've told, they don't make it on the news very much. They uh, are not going to be the they're not going to be the A students uh, <laughs> and, and, and the students who uh, the, the teacher used to write their name on the board if you're doing really good stuff. And I <clears throat> didn't get my name written on the board much. But, uh, but people who are paying attention to the values of the king in the stable make a huge impact. It may not be loud, but it's amazing. And so I think partly, partly what we're called to do is when we see someone among us rising up, support, appreciate, celebrate, pitch in, help out, go encourage. Because we live, partly we help vindicate God's kingdom and the hope that others have through our life together. God's kingdom has come, but earth and heaven have not become one yet. And in the meantime, we, the people of God, are called upon to help vindicate and encourage each other's hope in God's goodness and God's righteousness. And as I started thinking about this congregation, I realized that happens to me every day. Thanks be to God. Amen.